Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sanjot Mahendale, and I'm the chair of the Tang Center for Silk Road Studies and teach on Central Asia in the Department of Near Eastern Studies at UC Berkeley. Uh, it is, however, on behalf of the Central Asia Working Group that I'm welcoming you here today. Flowing out of the TCRS, uh, but focusing on modern topics and organized under the auspices of the Institute of East Asian Studies, the Central Asia Working Group was created to foster dialogue between UC Berkeley faculty and students whose research bears on the region. Now, these monthly gatherings have now grown into a more robust program and platform for Berkeley affiliates, affiliates and invited speakers to reach a broader audience. It's in the very capable hands of Frank B.A. and I would like to encourage Berkeley affiliates to reach out if they want to join the working group gatherings and others to sign up for the mailing list for public events. With that, uh, let me give a warm welcome to the author of today's book talk, UCSC Associate History Professor Maya Peterson. Professor Peterson received a PhD in history from Harvard University in 2011. Her expertise is in European and Russian history, comparative empire, colonialism, uh, environmental history, the history of science, technology, and medicine, and the history of Central Asia. At UC Santa Cruz, she teaches courses on the Silk Roads, Islam, Russian history, and the environment. Her most recent publication uh, and the subject of today's event is Pipe Dreams, Water and Empire in Central Asia's Aral Sea Basin, published by Cambridge University Press in 2019. A finalist for the Central Eurasian Studies Society's Book Prize in History and the Humanities, this book explores the ways in which both the Tsarist and Soviet regimes used fantasies of bringing the deserts to life as a means of claiming legitimacy in Central Asia, a process that ultimately led to the drying up of the Aral Sea. On a personal note, and I already told her this this afternoon uh, when we first met, uh, in my introductory class on Central Asia, the history of the Aral Sea and the challenging situation of in particular the Karakalpa community in the region is really a favorite topic among uh, students final project or research projects. So I've been very, very much looking forward to this talk. Um, so please help me virtually welcome Maya Peterson to the Central Asia uh, Working Group. Okay, thank you so much, Sanjot. And uh, thank you to Frank and to everyone from the Central Asia Working Group for inviting me today. I'm going to try to share my screen, so I hope this will work. So I am going to, my talk today is uh, structured around a number of terms that you can see in the title of my book. Uh, so I'm going to start with Central Asia and the Aral Sea Basin. Since we're on Zoom, I know there are people um, all over who are joining us for this webinar, and, and not everyone perhaps is familiar with the Central Asian region. So I'm going to start with that. Uh, I'm then going to move on to talk about the title, Pipe Dreams, and what that means and why I chose that as the title of the book. And then I'm going to move on to talk about uh, water and empire and uh, some of the, the larger themes that the book touches on um, about uh, Central Asia, but also about um, water and, and empire in places beyond Central Asia. Um, so that will be the conclusion of the talk. So I always like to start with a map. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Central Asian region, this is uh, usually what people mean when they talk about Central Asia, although you probably won't find Central Asia labeled as such on a map. Uh, in the Soviet period, Kazakhstan was uh, sometimes considered separate from the rest of Central Asia. So uh, you have references to Central Asia, meaning the southern uh, four Soviet republics of Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan, and then Kazakhstan was treated separately. And that's in part because the northern part of Kazakhstan in the late 19th century was governed with the steppe regions farther to the north, 
And the southern part of Kazakhstan was governed along with the southern part of the Central Asian region as the Russian province of Turkestan. So you might hear me refer to Turkestan. That's referring to this southern Central Asian region. That's the part of the region that I focus on in the book. And it also more or less corresponds to the Aral Sea Basin. So the Russian province of Turkestan and the Aral Sea Basin are more or less contiguous. The uh, Central Asia's Aral Sea Basin is a closed basin, and that means that all of the inputs of water into the basin come in the form of precipitation, and all of the water that leaves the basin leaves in the form of evaporation. And as you may be able to see on this map, there are some differences in topography between the eastern part of the region, uh, the mountainous parts of uh, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, and then the western part of the region is a much lower lying land in Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and southern Kazakhstan. This land is uh, much flatter, uh, much warmer, and also much drier. So most of the precipitation in the Aral Sea Basin falls in the form of snow. It's uh, then it in, falls in the mountains where it's stored in the glaciers or in snowpack. And then in the late spring and in the early summer, that snow begins to melt and the water is carried westward across the plains and deserts of the Aral Sea Basin. And you can see that somewhat better, I hope, on this map, which shows the two main rivers of Central Asia, the Sir Darya in the north and the Amu Darya in the south. And so most of the water from the mountains ends up in, in one or the other of the, the two major rivers. And those rivers historically found an endpoint in the Aral Sea uh, from which water would evaporate and uh, the cycle would then begin again. But as you may also be able to see on this image, um, there's a dotted line where the Amu Darya joins the Aral Sea. And uh, that's because uh, in recent years, the Amu Darya has no longer flowed into the sea. Uh, similarly, the Sir Darya flows into this uh, northern Aral Sea, which has really become separated from the rest of the sea. It's a separate entity of water. Um, and if I go back to um, the, the previous map, but a close up, I'm sorry, it's a little bit blurry. Uh, but you can see here that uh, the sea itself, as a result of the rivers no longer reaching it, has rapidly uh, shrunk. So it, the, the uh, waters have rapidly receded from where they were in the 1960s. In the 1960s, the Aral Sea was still considered the fourth largest lake in the world. And since that time, uh, much of it has disappeared. You can also see that on uh, satellite imagery of the region here, you can also see how arid the region is. Um, on this photo on the left, you can see the, the kind of uh, salty outlines of what used to be the uh, edges of the sea. And on the right, you can see a little bit better that Northern Aral Sea that has been uh, preserved. Um, and, and the rest of the, the water is in these smaller lobes which continue to shrink. You can also see in that photograph on the right that uh, there is a large dust storm. This is um, from about 2008, I believe. And this is dust that used to be on the sea floor. So this is the old bed of the sea that is now dried up and become exposed. And because the Aral Sea was quite polluted in the um, last decades of the Soviet Union, that, uh, that sand has absorbed uh, not only concentrated uh, salts, but also a lot of uh, agricultural runoff, pesticides, fertilizers. So it's really uh, salty, toxic dust that blows across large swaths of the region. It has created myriad health problems in the region, including uh, anemia, thyroid problems, respiratory problems, infant mortality. Uh, so the Disappearance of the Aral Sea is rightly considered one of the worst tragedies of the 20th century, one of the worst um, environmental disasters, we might say. And if you saw the 
event flyer for this talk, you're familiar with these images, these kind of iconic images of ships rusting in the middle of the desert, uh, people who once lived on the edge of the Aral Sea and made their living from fishing there have for decades no longer been able to do that. And they now are stranded uh, many, many miles away from any water. And as that, those maps uh, indicated to you, this is a, a story that is usually told as beginning in the 1960s. And in fact, that is when the rapid recession of the waters of the Aral Sea began. But in my book, I argue that um, we really can't tell this as a story that begins in the 1960s. And in fact, we really shouldn't tell it as a story that begins in the 1960s, because if we do, it's then far too easy to make this a Soviet problem. Uh, it's too easy to say that the disappearance of the Aral Sea is the result of Soviet gigantomania, um, of the love for large-scale hydraulic projects, uh, that this is a result of a maybe peculiarly communist disregard for the environment and that these kinds of environmental problems are ones that are only over there um, and that they don't really have that much to do with us. Uh, but in fact, in doing the research for the book, um, I came to realize more and more how much the problems of the Aral Sea Basin as an arid region are really the problems of arid regions everywhere um, in modern times. And uh, finishing the book here in California really you know, brought home for me the many ways in which the problems that California faces are also very similar to the problems of the Aral Sea Basin. So um, that brings me to uh, the next part of the talk, uh, which is this, the title, Pipe Dreams. And uh, a pipe dream is, is usually seen as a kind of fantastical uh, plan, something that is you know, really kind of impossible to realize uh, in, in the real world. And uh, in the book, I look at a number of schemes um, to transform the um, uh, lands and the, the lives of the people who lived in the Aral Sea Basin. And many of these were, in fact, pipe dreams at the time. Um, they were, uh, you know, kind of... Um, on a fantastical scale, people didn't have the, the, the kinds of knowledge and, and technology to carry out the large scale hydraulic projects to transform the deserts of Central Asia. Um, and so a lot of the projects that I look at in the book were actually failures at the time. But I argue that they set the stage for much more successful later projects to irrigate the deserts of Central Asia um, that have led to this rapid disappearance of the Aral Sea. Um, and the title also has, I mean, several other um, kind of connotations. So the word pipe uh, is a reference to the materiality of water infrastructure. Since the book is all about uh, water management, I do talk about pipes and canals and channels and dams. Um, but as the historian Ian Tyrell has said, irrigation is not just about pipes and about dams, but it has always been about dreams as well. And so I place a lot of emphasis as well on the second part of the title, the dreams and the visions that led to uh, the kinds of projects that have uh, ended up with the disappearance of the Aral Sea. And so I trace those dreams and those visions back to the 19th century. And so the book really looks at the century before the 1960s, from uh, the Russian initial Russian conquests in Central Asia in the 1860s, um, and then up through the, the 1940s, uh, and, and a little bit in the epilogue, um, tracing the, the end and the, the disappearance of the Aral Sea. And um, I call the period in the late 19th century and early 20th century in which these visions were rooted, I call this the irrigation age. Um, the 19th century was a time when professional engineers uh, were, uh, you know, sort of consolidating as a, a professional class. And by the late 19th century, there were uh, engineers who particularly specialized in the irrigation of arid 
regions. And these were people who believed that they had a kind of universal knowledge that they could uh, carry with them around the world and that they could apply in any arid regions um, and that they could transform deserts and make them bloom. The idea was that deserts uh, and arid regions were barren, they were wasteland, they needed to be improved, um, made suitable for agriculture, that that was the best way to use land and that was the best way to use water resources. Um, and in fact, there was a publication in the Western United States called The Irrigation Age, and that's where I got this idea from. Not that irrigation was, was new, of course, in the late 19th century, um, but there were uh, new ideas about um, how to use kind of very modern building materials, things like steel and concrete and new kinds of engineering methods to conquer nature in a way uh, in which nature had never been conquered before. Um, another thing about the dreams of this irrigation age that I really want to draw your attention to is that um, these kinds of dreams and visions shared by engineers and entrepreneurs and officials and others who are interested in transforming arid regions, um, they had a very kind of romanticized vision of the past that fueled them. Uh, and this was often a very ancient past, whether they were thinking about ancient Mesopotamia or uh, a kind of um, version of a biblical Eden that existed long ago and had disappeared. Um, Diana Davis has written about this in the case of North Africa, that the French in North Africa believed that North Africa had once been the granary of Rome, uh, and yet it had fallen into decline, and that that was the fault of the indigenous people who lived in Northern Africa, which then justified the French presence there. The French were coming in to restore the granary of Rome in Northern Africa. Uh, similarly, in the Western United States, uh, which a large uh, portion of which became part of the United States in the mid 19th century, uh, a lot of this, this land was seen as kind of wasteland, um, but it uh, then provoked questions about how to settle it and how to make it more productive. And by the late 19th century, engineers really believed that uh, irrigating the arid lands of places like California and turning them into sort of the um, you know, we now talk about the region that I'm in close by here, we talk about it being the salad bowl of the world, right? So this idea of um, taking what was not productive land and making it productive, improving it, this was um, seen as the best way of using the water resources. And similarly, it was seen that the indigenous people of uh, North America were poor stewards of the land. They were people who didn't know how to use the land properly. And this justified this kind of imperialist intervention. And so in the case of Central Asia, which I write about in the book, um, Russian engineers and others uh, constantly were looking for traces of the past in the deserts of Central Asia. They were looking for traces of ancient civilizations that had once flourished along the Silk Roads, and they were also looking for uh, traces of, of old irrigation canals to prove that this land had once been more fertile in the past and that they could now step in um, and take over where the indigenous people of Central Asia had, had failed, had let this uh, land fall into decline, and this legitimated a, uh, a Russian uh, imperial project in the region. So that's kind of where I'm coming from with this idea of pipe dreams, um, that, that these are dreams rooted in a, an irrigation age that it was common to, um, to many, at least, you know, Europeans and Americans who then went out into many parts of the world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to transform them. Uh, in the case of Central Asia, when, uh, so like the, the American West, which was uh, acquired as this large chunk of land from Mexico, um, the Russians acquired a very large territory, this Southern Central Asian territory, uh, between the 1860s and the 1880s through a series of very rapid conquests of existing Central Asian states. And uh, like the American West, this was this huge expanse, much of which was, was very dry and arid, much of which was desert, and Russians had to kind of figure out how to incorporate this territory and how to make it a, a productive colony of the empire. 
And initial ideas uh, involved routing trade from uh, places like China and India through Central Asia, through those uh, lands through which the ancient Silk Routes had passed, uh, and up through Russia into Europe. But uh, Russians very quickly figured out that Central Asian rivers were very different from the Russian rivers that they were used to. Uh, in the Russian Empire, before the railroads were built in the late 19th century, the rivers were really the highways of Russia. Uh, but in Central Asia, the rivers were much shallower. They carried huge loads of silt, and so they often changed their course, and that made them very difficult for navigation. Uh, and the Russians realized, too, that you know, even if you could navigate the entire length of the Amudarya or the Sirdarya, you ended up in the Aral Sea. And that was uh, in the middle of you know, the lake, in the middle of a desert that was inhabited by hostile nomadic peoples. So by the end of the 19th century, like people in the American West, uh, many Russians had come to the conclusion that the best use of Central Asia's scarce water resources was uh, diverting those waters into the desert um, for irrigated agriculture. And so that's the shift that takes place um, around the, the, the turn of the century. Uh, there are a number of uh, engineers who go from Russia to uh, places like the United States, um, other places too, but people were particularly interested in the kinds of irrigation projects that American engineers were carrying out in the West. And American engineers also came to Central Asia as well. Um, and the most notable figure there is Arthur Powell Davis, who first came to the Russian Empire in 1911. Uh, when he went back to the US, he became the head of the Reclamation Service, which later became the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, the Hoover Dam was almost named after him. So he was quite an important figure in uh, water management in the United States. And he was so excited about what he had initially seen on that visit to the Russian Empire in 1911 that he left Oakland in 1929 and he traveled to Moscow and then to Tashkent and he spent a couple of years serving as the main consultant to the Soviet Cotton Committee. Uh, and here you can see an article from the New York Times that's very enthusiastic about uh, Davis's uh, new endeavor. He didn't actually end up having 30 aides, as was uh, projected here, but he did have a small team of American engineers who helped him to consult on uh, the various irrigation projects that were being undertaken by the Soviet Union in Central Asia. And he was quite enthusiastic about um, Soviet plans. And he, in fact, foresaw that the Aral Sea, a large part of it might disappear. And that was okay, because it would uncover land that would then be good for agriculture. And that's something about these, these dreams of the irrigation age. They predicted the disappearance of the Aral Sea long before it ever disappeared. Um, so even if those early projects were not successful, um, they kind of knew that, that this might happen. It was, it was not necessarily an intended consequence of their visions, um, but it was also not unforeseen. And so I think that's, that's important for us to remember is that uh, we think of the disappearance of the sea today as a, as a real tragedy, um, but many of those people would not have seen it that way because they would have seen a better use of the water as going to the deserts. Uh, so Davis, I think, and his his uh, bridging, um, you know, serving as a bridge between the the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union is a good way to uh, transition to my third uh, part of the talk about water and empire. And um, I'm looking in the book at uh, both the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union, and about uh, Central Asia's role within uh, both of those states. And so I, I look, uh, I'm really interested in, you know, kind of what stayed the same and what really changed uh, in the transition between the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. So on the one hand, uh, the Russian Empire was very much, uh, strove to be an empire in, you know, following the model of, of other European empires. And the Soviet Union, in contrast, was formed as uh, an explicitly anti-imperial state. And that was in fact the way in which uh, the Bolsheviks 
appealed to the peoples of Central Asia. They told them that they were being liberated from the oppressive uh, forces of the past, including the rule of the Russian czars um, and including the, the kinds of racist policies of the Russians. Um, and I think, you know, there, there was a lot of uh, genuine, there were a lot of genuine impulses behind uh, the Bolshevik revolution of 1917 and the the modernizing um, and transformative projects that were introduced in the early Soviet period. So many uh, Bolsheviks really did believe in making the various uh, ethnic groups of the former empire equal to one another. Uh, and that even meant promoting uh, minority groups ahead of ethnic Russians um, because with the idea that they had been held back in the Russian empire. Uh, there were also, of course, efforts to uh, create new opportunities for peasants and workers, um, for women as well, and to make people literate, uh, to educate them, people who had never had these opportunities before. And so certainly Central Asians, like people in other parts of the Soviet Union, did benefit from these kinds of projects. Um, more people did become literate, more uh, women and, uh, and farmers and peasants did have opportunities that they had never had before. So I think there is, there is something that was, uh, that was very genuine, at least in that, the early Soviet period. There's already by the 1930s, the Soviet state has, has backed off of some of these projects. Um, so for instance, uh, the idea of, of all people being equal is, is replaced by this trope of the friendship of the peoples in which the... Uh, Russians are the kind of elder brother of all of the other peoples of the Soviet Union. And so they're kind of there to, to help guide um, these peoples who were seen as, as, you know, sort of backwards and in need of modernization, helping them to step into the modern world. Uh, but so there are, there are good uh, sides of the Soviet project. Um, but I think that when we take an environmental perspective, as I do in this work, then it becomes a little bit messier. And um, in particular, uh, the role in which, uh, the, or the role that Central Asia played uh, in the Russian Empire and the role that it played in the, the Soviet Union in, in economic terms um, was very similar. So uh, I mentioned that there's this kind of interest in, um, in irrigated agriculture at the end of the 19th century under the czars. Most of that irrigated agriculture was cotton agriculture. And there are uh, several reasons why the Russians were particularly interested in cotton. One of those was that there was a global concern around the turn of the 20th century that Americans were monopolizing the global cotton market and the Russian empire, like other empires, uh, was looking for new sources of cotton to avoid uh, sending so much money abroad um, to the Americans. And having conquered this new Central Asian region, uh, Turkestan, in the late 19th century, this was a place that was uh, quite warm. So so it was suitable for growing cotton. And in fact, a variety of cotton was already grown in the region. And so it made sense to continue to develop cotton agriculture there. Uh, what, the, what many engineers hoped to do was to expand, and officials also, um, entrepreneurs and others, they wanted to expand the irrigated acreage within Central Asia and so that they could grow more cotton. But it turns out that irrigating arid regions is quite difficult, especially if you don't have much training uh, in that area. So even though many people praised what Americans were doing in the West, American engineers struggled quite a bit too. They were mostly coming from the East Coast where water is quite abundant. And so the, the challenges of uh, irrigating an arid region were very new to them. And this was the same for Russians. Russian engineers were trained in places like St. Petersburg, which is a city that was reclaimed from the marshes, and it has the problems of Northern Europe. Uh, you know, so there's too much water rather than too little. So going to, to Central Asia, they, you know, found that um, they really were not that successful in, in expanding the irrigated acreage of Central Asia. And so in order to grow more cotton, what they did instead was to incentivize farmers to plant cotton instead of other crops on land that was already irrigated. So Central Asians themselves had developed sophisticated irrigation techniques over many centuries, uh, 
Russians and and foreign engineers poo pooed this as you know too too labor intensive and as the, these systems were primitive, um, you know they they claimed that they could you know bring in these kinds of latest engineering techniques, but it was difficult. And so many of the um, the projects actually you know didn't go that far. There was also a, a lack of funding for the projects, which was um, a major hindrance as well. And so most of the uh, increase in cotton came not because more land was irrigated, but because cotton. Uh, increasingly replaced other food crops. And that became a particular problem for Central Asia uh, around 1917 and in the uh, chaotic years of civil war following 1917. So a lot of irrigation systems fell into decline. Uh, but Central Asia was also cut off from the rest of the country for several years. And as a result of not being able to import the food on which they had become dependent, many Central Asians starved. And this was a problem. Uh, the fact that, that the former Russian Empire uh, was undergoing famine was something that was known outside of Russia. Uh, for instance, Herbert Hoover, uh, through his American Relief Administration, sent a lot of relief aid to places like Ukraine and the central Volga region, but Russian Turkestan and its problems were largely ignored. So Central Asians suffered quite a bit uh, as a result of the czarist decision to transform a lot of uh, food crops into cotton crops. And the Soviet authorities could have, you know, seen this and recognized this and made a change, but they believed that Central Asia would be uh, integrated into the Soviet economy and would be able to get food from other parts of the country. And so they uh, really pushed to continue developing cotton agriculture in the region. And there's now this new ideological uh, reason for wanting to become independent of uh, imports of American cotton. They don't want to be dependent on hostile capitalist countries. So in Stalin's first five-year plan, which is the late 1920s, early 1930s, this is his push to collectivize agriculture and push for rapid industrialization of the country. Um, Central Asia's part in the first five-year plan really is to provide uh, uh, cotton for the the, um, the planned economy. And this was typical of the Soviet planned economy. Different regions were supposed to specialize in different kinds of raw materials and different kinds of products. So Central Asia was seen as the cotton producing region. And it was then, um, its sort of goal then was to, to produce cotton for uh, the center, to produce cotton for Moscow. And with each successive five-year plan, the production quotas uh, for cotton, the harvest uh, quotas, were ratcheted up so much so that by the late Soviet period, Central Asian leaders were facing impossibly high numbers. They were expected to, with each plan, produce more and more and more cotton. Um, so this explains why you have these major hydraulic projects, uh, particularly in the post-war years as, you know, there's this imperative to grow more and more cotton. Um, but they were also, uh, many of them built uh, very quickly and uh, built rather shoddily. So, um, for instance, starting in the 1950s, uh, the Karakum Canal uh, began to be built through the Turkmen deserts. Um, it was never lined. It is not lined to this day. And so, uh, large amounts of water have been lost to uh, seepage, they seep into the ground. It also goes for hundreds of miles through the Turkmen deserts, so lots of water is lost to evaporation. Uh, many irrigation systems were built without proper drainage systems, and so what happens is uh, water ends up pooling in the desert and uh, creating large areas of, of waterlogged land that is not good for agriculture. And the particular problem of applying too much water in an arid region is that you bring soluble salts up through the, uh, the soil, they collect on the top of the soil and they harden into a crust, which makes agriculture really impossible. So uh, water logging and salinization, these were uh, problems that had faced czarist engineers. They also plagued Soviet engineers. And they're a reason that a lot of arable land um, has been taken out of cultivation in Central Asia today. So if we kind of look at this longer trajectory, we think about uh, Central Asia from an environmental point of view, 
we see that it in many ways uh, resembles a kind of colony of the Soviet Union in terms of uh, producing raw materials, uh, the way that, that raw materials are often extracted from colonies. And of course, the environmental problems that come with the disappearance of the Aral Sea, the uh, health problems that I mentioned, also economic problems like people who had other kinds of, of employment, not in the cotton sector, but who, for instance, were fishermen, um, lost their livelihoods. And so you have, um, you know, people who, who feel that um, this has all been done uh, because Moscow has very little regard for uh, the value of life in Central Asia. So in that way, I see a lot of continuities across 1917 from an environmental point of view. But I also want to emphasize that uh, the Soviet Union was not just a reincarnation of the Russian Empire. So I've already mentioned these kinds of modernizing impulses. And um, Russian imperial presence had been fairly weak uh, before 1917. But the Soviet state is a much more intrusive force into Central Asian people's lives. Um, sometimes that brings, you know, good things like literacy programs. Uh, but often uh, the the ways in which the state intruded into people's lives were, were not as benign. And this is something that I look at in the last part of the book, um, where I look specifically at Soviet labor practices. And I think that understanding um, what happened in the Soviet Union, uh, in Soviet Central Asia in the 1930s, can really help us uh, to understand some of the Soviet legacies in the region. Um, I, I, in the last chapter of the book, I look at a project to irrigate the Vakhsh River Valley, which is in uh, the far south of Tajikistan, right on the Afghan border. And um, this started as part of the, the first five-year plan in the early 1930s. And it was um, a project that was uh, touted all over the Soviet Union as this uh, project that was going to modernize this really backward part, or this really remote part of the Soviet Union. Um, and the idea was that workers would come from all over, and particularly all kinds of parts of Central Asia, and through their participation in this massive uh, socialist construction project, the construction uh, of a very uh, new kind of irrigation system using the latest technologies and the latest engineering methods and the latest materials like concrete and steel, um, they would participate in the socialist project and they would themselves be transformed from the most reluctant uh, sheep herder or camel driver into a truck driver or an engineer. So this was supposed to bring new opportunities and new kinds of, of wealth to Central Asia. It was for the purpose of growing Egyptian cotton, and Central Asians themselves would be modernized in the process, so it was thought. So this uh, kind of socialist construction project was going to put socialism um, on view and the benefits of socialism for the people of Central Asia and also for the people across the border in Afghanistan. Um, and this is a project that I first discovered in the archives in Moscow. I found a photo album. Here you can see um, excavators at work in this remote region. Um, but often the excavators actually weren't able to work because this place was so far from roads and from railroads that uh, the machines often didn't have fuel. They didn't have spare parts when they broke down, no one knew how to fix them. And the project itself suffered from a lack of supplies. Uh, people had to live in leaky barracks and eat terrible food. So there was a, a really terrible lack of morale in spite of all the propaganda about how this was a project of national importance. And so most people ended up voting with their feet and leaving the project and going elsewhere uh, because they could. I think these photos perhaps um, do a little bit better job of capturing what it was probably uh, really like. You see some manual labor, you see what looks like a, a machine that's kind of uh, stuck in a rut. And um, this project is actually on the cover of my book. Um, this was the cover of the photo album, this black and white image. But as you may recognize, it's actually not a photograph. It's a drawing. It's an imagined vision of what this canal was going to look like. Uh, you see the, the ornamental cotton bowls and the excavators. And the excavators are holding a banner that says that the Vakhsh River has been tamed and giving all of the credit to uh, the socialist state and socialist construction. But in reality, by this point, much of the labor was uh, forced labor. 
Uh, this was a time in the late 1930s when many Soviet citizens were being sent to the gulag to participate in forced labor. And so these were people who could not vote with their feet, who could not leave um, even if they wanted to. And so the, the state, you know, sort of quietly took um, the, the emphasis and attention away from this uh, mostly failed project. It is eventually finished later in the post-war period. Um, but by 1939, they have a new uh, a new kind of triumph to celebrate. And this is the uh, construction of the Great Fergana Canal farther north in Central Asia in the Fergana Valley. And this was the project, as you can see in this photograph, uh, that really didn't involve technology. It didn't involve fancy excavators uh, or, or trucks or really machines of any kind. It depended on manual labor. And uh, it depended on the manual labor of tens of thousands of collective farmers who had been herded onto collective farms uh, during Stalin's first five-year plan. They were then mobilized to come out with their hoes and their shovels, the traditional tools of uh, making irrigation networks uh, in Central Asia. And they uh, dug in the hot August sun. Uh, August and September was when this project took place. Uh, it was completed in about a month. I think the canal was 270 kilometers long. And um, so it was celebrated as this enormous triumph. This was something that, you know, that a successful project of the kind that no one in Soviet Central Asia had seen before. And what was particularly interesting to me was the ways in which it was uh, sort of um, framed for uh, the Soviet people, but also for the Central Asian people themselves. So, uh, in newspapers, this was uh, touted as something that was had come from the will of the people, the desire of the people for water. This was an age-old desire that none of Central Asia's rulers had ever managed to realize. And it was only Soviet power um, that was able to kind of harness the power of the people into these new forms of free and conscious socialist labor, uh, a kind of labor that would be impossible in a capitalist country, and uh, to, you know, organize labor in a new way to complete a new kind of project. And these projects were called uh, people's construction projects. Narodnia Stroiki, Halk um, Kurelishe is the, uh, the Uzbek word, and so the idea is that these are initiatives of the people and it's just the guidance of the Soviet state that makes this whole project possible. And the people's construction projects are then exported from the Central Asian borderlands to other parts of the Soviet Union where uh, kind of mass labor is used on, on other kinds of projects as well. Um, it's called free socialist labor, right? But if you're a collective farmer, you probably didn't have a whole lot of say in whether or not you wanted to go out and dig this canal for the state. So I, I would really say that, in fact, the lines of, of free and forced labor are quite blurred here. It is the collectivization of agriculture that has made this new kind of mobilization possible, but this is certainly not uh, an example of free will. Um, but what was even more important or, to me or more interesting to me is that um, to to the Central Asian people, this was uh, not just a people's construction project, but the state um, framed it as a new form of hashar. And the hashar was an indigenous Central Asian institution whereby people were expected to give uh, some of their time and some of their labor each year uh, to public works projects, uh, including the construction and maintenance of irrigation canals. And, but, you know, the Soviet state, uh, to differentiate itself from this older kind of corvée labor, instead uh, said that this new kind of Soviet hashar was a holiday. Um, it was a celebratory event. And you can see in this photograph here, these men with the long karnai, this, uh, this horn and the frame drum, they're playing music for the workers. There were dance troops, people in, in ethnic costume performing dances in the evenings. There were moving cinemas that moved along the construction site with the workers. So that at the end of the day, they could catch the latest films. Um, you could uh, become literate at these projects by attending a few hours of school, supposedly. I don't know where you would find the time to do that. And so the idea is that this 
is uh, free will. This is the desire of the people that is being made possible by the Soviet state. It's joyful and it's celebratory. And perhaps this initial project was. Um, but, you know, later people's construction projects, were they as elaborate? Um, probably not. And certainly this invocation of the Hashar, um, this kind of duty to the state, continues to be a part of discourse in places like Uzbekistan, um, where uh, forced labor in the cotton fields continues to be a problem even today. So there's a quota system uh, for agriculture in Uzbekistan. People still don't have control over you know, how much food they can grow versus how much cotton they um, owe portions of this to the state, large portions, and people are mobilized every year to uh, go into the cotton fields and to pick the cotton. Uh, so there were lots of these reports in recent years. And then uh, Uzbekistan got a new government in 2016. And it seemed that perhaps things were getting better. Uh, but we have evidence that uh, people still are using this idea of the hashar um, to force people to leave their jobs, to leave their classrooms, and to go into the cotton fields in the fall uh, and pick this uh, ILO report suggests using uh, better wages and better conditions rather than the idea of the hashar to, to get people um, to come. And, and, you know, in fact, the state has said that uh, this is really not a hashar. These are, you know, people doing it on a voluntary basis, on a contract basis. This is all legal. Uh, but then you have people sharing screenshots um, from, you know, uh, messages from local authorities saying that, in fact, this language of Hashar, uh, which really, you know, gives people no choice, this is an obligation uh, to leave their jobs and to go into the cotton fields and to, to labor in the, the fields for free for the state, that this is still uh, a major problem in the region. And so I think that, um, I'm going to start wrapping up now, I think that, um, you know, the Errol C. Uh, problem has, has become very visible. It's a, a problem that has attracted a lot of attention around the world and the ecological dimensions, the ecological situation uh, is understood in many ways, but, the, but other kinds of legacies of, um, of empire and of, of water management in the region, these older stories and these older legacies are, are not as evident to, to people um, who are, are just looking at the Aral Sea as a kind of, you know, a, an environmental tragedy. Um, and in the, the uh, introduction, uh, Sanjot mentioned the Karakalpaks. I think that's also, uh, you know, who are the Karakalpaks? I think most people probably have never heard of them. These are the people who uh, traditionally lived in the Southern Aral Sea region. And they're in fact a minority group within Uzbekistan. So this kind of makes everything more complicated because they're doubly marginalized. The Uzbeks were marginalized within the Soviet Union and then the Karakalpaks have been marginalized within Uzbekistan. So even though we now have a, a free and independent Uzbekistan, it's a state for the Uzbek people. It's not necessarily a state for the Karakalpak people, even though they have their own autonomous region. Um, and so I think that, you know, there's probably less incentive uh, to help this region. It's one of the poorer regions of the country. Um, so you have Uzbek people in general uh, suffering at the hands of their own people who continue to um, kind of, you know, invoke older uh, Soviet practices and, and ways of doing things. And then you have uh, the Karakalpaks who speak a language that's closer to Kazakh. Um, as of 2019, only about half of Karakalpak households had access to uh, safe drinking water. Um, so, you know, this is a, a reminder that, um, you know, these these things uh, are, are getting better in some ways and they are changing in some ways. There's been uh, you know, a lot of World Bank effort in the region, uh, but there still are a number of problems that remain to be addressed. And I think that often are overlooked by people who are just kind of you know, on the surface interested in the Aral Sea as, as an environmental tragedy. Um, these other kinds of social and economic and political legacies that remain. So to wrap up some of what I've said, um, I believe that uh, long before the 1960s, these visions stemming from the irrigation age going back to the 19th century have shaped uh, Central Asia's landscapes and not just the landscapes, but the lives of the people who live there. 
these narratives of decline and liberation um, that are, are kind of bound up in these visions have uh, legitimated Russian and then Soviet imperialism in the region. And while the RLC has brought attention to the ecological situation, many of these, these other legacies are kind of less visible to us. Um, and then I just also want to, to say that these are not only problems of Central Asia or even of the global South, you know, we might think, okay, you know, people, poor people in, in poor parts of the world don't have access to to drinking water, but um, issues of environmental justice and, and especially access to water are issues that um, are all over. Uh, so in this country, in the United States, there are, uh, you know, imperial legacies affect Native American peoples, many of whom don't have good access to, uh, to clean and fresh drinking water. We've seen this with the um, Standing Rock Sioux protesting the Dakota Access Pipeline, but also uh, the Navajo Nation where water remains really scarce. Um, but other places have been marginalized uh, and, um, and impoverished you know, in, in other ways, not just um, because of imperialism. Flint, Michigan, uh, and the water situation there is uh, familiar to, to most Americans, I would hope. But right here in California, there are millions or you know, at least a million people who don't have access to clean water. That's probably something not many people here in California think about. Um, and then I also just want to emphasize that um, we haven't left behind this uh, fascination with large-scale hydraulic projects in the 20th century, um, that it, it has come with us into the 21st century. Uh, so in the the former Soviet space, uh, a project that was initially raised, an idea that was initially raised in the 19th century, um, became quite popular in the Soviet period before it was uh, shelved under Gorbachev in the 1980s. But this was the idea of transferring water from the rivers of Siberia south to the, fix the problems of the Aral Sea Basin. And uh, more recently, the ex-mayor of Moscow, Yuri Lushkov, suggested to Putin that Russia could just sell its water to Central Asia, which is really galling if you think about um, this long history of, of imperialism and colonialism in the region. Um, China has uh, started to enact a north-south uh, transfer, water transfer um, project. And right here in North America, um, a, a plan that was first raised in the 1950s periodically crops up, and that's to um, bring water from uh, Alaska and Canada to solve the drought problems of the American West and also the kinds of cross-border problems that um, the, the West and the Southwest have with Northern Mexico. So a really kind of crazy scheme, but it continues to have uh, its proponents. So I'm going to stop there and um, I'll be happy to answer any questions about the book or about any of these themes that I have raised. Well, thank you, Maya, for this very revealing talk. And thank you for sharing, uh, you know, the content of your book, which sounds very, very fascinating. And I'm really slightly embarrassed to uh, admit that I hadn't come across it, uh, even though I had been, you know, talking about the ROC for um, a number of years. So I'm very happy to to be um, to know about it, and I'll certainly incorporate it into into my my intro class. Um, I particularly like how you put uh, this project in comparative perspective, um, and also you know included the U not not just the U.S. but the, the the U.S. part was was quite fascinating because we do. You're right. We tend to think of it you know, something that happened there, right? It's it's outside of the US, it's the Soviet Union, it's not us. Um, so I thought that was uh, wonderful. And also sort of the continuities that you underscored from sort of Russian imaginaries all the way into sort of um, the, the, the Soviet Union. Um, there is a question uh, in, in the box, but I, but I had one of my own. Um, and that has to do with whether or not there is also a, a Central Asia narrative here, because we, we tend to sort of think Soviet equals Russia, Soviet project equals Russian, you know, ethnic Russian projects. Um, but as with several modernized, quote, modern Soviet modernization projects, um, Central Asians, uh, certain Central Asians uh, bought into those those modernization projects, and I'm wondering whether there's any literature about uh, Central Asian expertise or or individuals who are also involved in these in these 
sort of schemes to to modernize the their their home their home territories yeah that's a great question and it's it's certainly something i try to get at in the book it's difficult of course to uncover some of those central asian voices particularly in the early period so you know i really did most of my research um in the Soviet period on the 1920s and 1930s. And at that point, there were right. no right. Uh, Soviet Central Asian engineers, it, all Soviet rhetoric aside. There was actually um, a novel that was written uh, in the, the 1930s, a socialist realist novel called Man Changes His Skin about the Vakhsh irrigation construction project and there there's a, this uh, lively Uzbek engineer who um, you know plays right. this, this important role in the project but he, he didn't have a counterpart in reality um, at the same time I mean certainly um, the you know, leaders of these places were interested in modernization projects and were interested in projects that would um, allow you know their their economies to to be developed um, that would allow new infrastructure to be built uh, and so I think you know they they joined in in many ways with these kinds of, of visions about transformation of, of lands and livelihoods that was not necessarily seen as a bad thing you know it was only later when there these really onerous burdens were being placed on Central Asians that some of them started to, to speak out. Um, and it's really interesting because I think, you know, in, in the Uzbek Soviet Republic, uh, the big scandal of the 1980s was called the Cotton Affair. And um, the Soviet uh, Uzbek leadership, you know, including uh, many Central Asians uh, were accused of corruption. Uh, they were purged. They were replaced by people who were sent in from other parts of the Soviet Union. So there's this kind of idea that, you know, these are these, these corrupt people who don't know how to manage their own resources. They were said to have falsified the cotton statistics. And they probably did because there was just no way that they could produce the amount of, of cotton that was being required of them by the center. Um, and these people were really in favor of that Soviet Di uh, Siberian water diversion plan, which sounds so crazy, this idea of, of taking water that flows northward in Siberian rivers to the Arctic Sea and diverting a large portion of that to flow southward. And many of them really believed that the Soviet government was, was serious in its intent. Uh, there were, you know, hu huge numbers of people who were um, tasked with with investigating you know whether or not this was possible and how it could be done and central asians really believed that that moscow you know kind of wanted this to happen and that this water was going to come and it was going to help them um, and the leaders may in fact have have falsified the numbers because they thought they would get water right. <laughs> in time to you know um to actually to produce some some real cotton so i actually have some sympathy uh for people like sharaf rashidov who was the the first secretary of the um, the Uzbek Communist Party after, you know, kind of understanding the pressures that they were under um, to, to produce. So, you know, you have then uh, people in, in the 1980s speaking out um, about uh, the RLC. And it's really interesting. They couldn't really talk about cotton because the, the Republic was still so dependent on cotton, but they could talk about the problem of the Aral Sea because environmentalism was was seen as something that was was okay to talk about in the Soviet Union. This was, you know, a, a love for the Soviet motherland. And so they could kind of lament the disappearance of the Aral Sea, but then kind of quietly slip in there, um, you know, the fact that these, these large-scale um, projects had, you know, not only destroyed the sea, but had really put uh, Central Asians in this this position, this really impossible position where they were being asked to produce more and more cotton and, and by the late Soviet period, also food. <laughs> so they, they were sending produce to other parts of the Soviet Union, um, but with less and less water. Um, so I think that the involvement of and the attitudes of the Central Asians is, is really interesting because on the one hand, they were in favor of, of modernization projects, um, but not at the expense of um, their livelihoods and of their health. All right. Thank you. I'm going to move to some of the questions. Um, to what extent is China's Belt and Road Initiative affecting water supply and how is water used in Central Asia? Historically, has China had much of an impact on the issues on which you focused in the book, including the use of water to grow cotton in Xinjiang starting in the 1950s. 
Yeah, you know, I haven't found a lot that's directly related to the Belt and Road Initiative um, that is uh, related to, you know, water projects in Central Asia. But certainly, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that, that the issue of Xinjiang was raised <clears throat> because forced labor in the cotton industry in Xinjiang is actually a major problem um, today. And uh, I think Xinjiang, I read somewhere that it um, produces 20% of the world's cotton. I don't know if that's possible. Something like 80% of, of China's cotton. That seems like too much. Um, but uh, it's it's certainly got a parallel story to um, the story of, of Soviet Central Asia. Um, and today there uh, are definitely uh, Chinese schemes that would take water um, that is shared between China and Kazakhstan. Um, and, you know, that, that water would, would go uh, southward to projects in China. And so there, there is um, a potential for, for conflict, um, cross-border conflict between China and Kazakhstan there. But I haven't seen anything directly related to the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, that doesn't mean it's not there. I'm by no means an expert on the, on the BRI. And it seems like the, the Chinese have their, their fingers everywhere. Um, certainly, they're involved in a lot of infrastructure building projects in Central Asia. Um, but I don't know of, of um, water projects, specific, uh, specifically water projects. Um, but if, you know, there may be people in the audience who know more about this than I do. So thank you for the question. Related to that, um, there was an earlier question whether diverting water from the rivers to irrigate the cotton fields, w w whether that was the main cause of the drying up of the Aral Sea, is that sort of yeah, so because the Aral Sea um, only gets, it, you know, really doesn't get much precipitation, it only gets inputs of water uh, from the rivers, uh, the uh, progressively diverting more and more water into, uh, again, mostly for cotton agriculture, uh, was the, uh, the major cause, but also uh, water has been trapped behind uh, hydroelectric dams upstream in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. And uh, so that water then that's used to produce hydroelectricity, only some of that then makes it um, to the downstream countries. And this has actually been, a, a, so it's, it's on the one hand, uh, irrigated agriculture, and on the other hand, the building of reservoirs, those were mostly built, the, the biggest ones in the 1960s and the 1970s, and there's still uh, more projects on the books. So in Tajikistan, for instance, uh, there's a major dam that's slated to be the biggest dam in the world, the Rohun Dam. Um, and this is this is one again where the Tajik people have been uh, co-opted into basically helping the state to pay for this dam. They, they've had to buy shares in the dam. Um, but it's something that these large dams are, are actually something that, um, you know, going back to the, the initial question about, you know, Central Asian involvement with these projects, um, People are perhaps, you know, I think in the United States, we, we're, we live in an era where we're taking down some of the big dams that were built in the 20th century, um, not building uh, bigger ones. Um, but uh, people, you know, see uh, the construction of hydroelectric dams as, as potentially a key to boosting their economies uh, that they can then sell um, hydropower to uh, places, you know, neighbors like uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. And um, so it's actually seen as, as a, a positive thing, the building of, of bigger and bigger dams. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll see uh, the upstream countries, as, as I showed at the beginning, are, are very, very mountainous. And so, you know, agriculture is only possible in parts of these countries, unlike the downstream countries. And the downstream countries also have things like oil and gas, um, which, uh, you know, is... is doesn't sell at the same price um, as water on the market. So although there, there is a developing water market, we'll see how that goes. Um, but at the moment, you know, these, these countries don't have a lot going for them, uh, the upstream countries, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. And so uh, hydropower is, is kind of some leverage that they have over the downstream countries. And this is, this has almost led to conflict uh, sometimes when, um, the Tajiks and the Kyrgyz actually, they're withholding the water that they're supposed to send downstream in the summertime. Um, and instead they're releasing water in the wintertime to uh, produce energy so that they don't have to buy oil and gas from their neighbors. Um, so these kinds of, of, of issues are, are, um, are definitely important ones. <laughs> 
Then there is a comment. I don't think it's really a question, but I recently read that in the Western U.S. hedge fund investors are buying up water rights with the expectation that in time they can sell them to the newly to newly established towns at a profit. Yes, there is a, a so-called water futures market um, that has recently emerged and that I don't know that much about, but it sounds really scary. So that's right. certainly something to look out for. Um, and so from, you discuss how the, oh, my question just disappeared there. You discuss how the imaginary of infrastructure sought its legit legitimacy in depictions of historical irrigation systems and civilizational discourses. Do you know if Soviet archaeology teams were pulled into this mm -hmm. program to construct these narratives and connections? It's from Tim Winter. Hmm, that's a very interesting question. Soviet archaeology teams, not that I know of, although... I mean, certainly Soviet archaeologists were quite active in Central Asia and, and archaeologists continue to, um, to study these things today. But so the question was uh, whether they were, they were used to... They were pulled into the... Into to the talk about the kind of past civilizations. I, I mean, I think, I think that discourse was already quite well established. And, um, you know, you don't, you don't even need irrigation canals to, to see that they're, um, you know... Central Asia supported splendid cities in the past. Um, and so, you know, even in, in places like uh, Bukhara and Samarkand, uh, when the Russians arrived, these were places that were crumbling. And so, you know, they could say these were places that once were great that clearly are no longer great. So I think, I think that that narrative of decline was, was quite well established even without the irrigation canals. But, um, uh, but certainly, I mean, Archaeologists have uh, found uh, evidence of, of very sophisticated irrigation systems, including um, these these underground channels that exist uh, all the way, you know, across Eurasia, Kares, yeah. really from from northern Africa, but all the way to Xinjiang. Um, they're called Kares or Kariz um, in the Central Asian region, but they're called Kanat uh, in in North Africa, for instance, um, or Fogara. Uh, so these are are uh, channels that use gravity to bring water through underground channels from uh, hills of mountains to places where that water can be used either for irrigating fields or for um, for drinking water for municipal purposes. And these were really sophisticated because unlike these surface level canals, they didn't lose a lot of water through evaporation. They were uh, lined with stone um, and they were quite difficult to make. Uh, so Persians were, were the ones who were known as the best um, Karez builders and then Karez masters. And so Central Asians actually hired Persians to come and, and build these things. There were quite a few uh, in Turkmenistan. And something I'd love to know more about is that the Tsarist government actually built at least one uh, Karez in the region around Ashgabat, the capital of Turkmenistan, in the late 19th century. Um, they didn't do any more, probably because it was expensive and it was difficult. Um, and I, I also sort of think that, you know, it's, it's less impressive because it's underground. You don't see it, even though it's really quite sophisticated. Uh, building these, these canals that resembled rivers, but that were really straight um, and that were, you know, that looked like rivers that had been kind of tamed and, and made to flow within, you know, their banks and no longer change course. I think this was much more appealing to engineers because it was a way of, of projecting their authority onto the landscape and a way of contrasting um, the, the kinds of, of newly engineered projects with indigenous systems that perhaps followed contours uh, in the landscape uh, more and therefore looked, um, you know, the Russian engineers always like to use words like like haphazard and, and chaotic uh, to describe these, these existing irrigation systems. Um, and they contrasted them to the idea of kind of European engineered uh, canals, which were, were very visibly um, not, they were very visibly artificial. They were very visibly an imposition on the landscape. Right. Has there been Soviet era reflection mm -hmm. slash criticism of the long term viability of construction methods? Unlined canals, etc. I would also like to know the most devastated ethnic community 
initially and to this day. Uh, so I, I assume that's post-Soviet uh, critique of these these um, these kinds the of Soviet era, yeah. Yeah, I mean, to some extent, uh, it's it was understood. I mean, Soviet engineers weren't weren't stupid. They they knew um, <laughs> from early on that you know you had to to um, build canals in certain kinds of ways. You had to provide uh, proper uh, drainage systems if you didn't want the water to to pool and to form you know these lakes uh, in the desert. You had to, to line the canals if you didn't want to lose um, the water into the, the ground. But they they made certain decisions to cut corners, um, and you know the Turkmen Canal, uh, the the Karakum Canal was was very impressive. It's sometimes called a, the the Karakum River. Um, that you know it's a, the idea of making a river flow through the desert. Um, so you know I think yes there has been some talk of course of of improving them. Um, you know and many consultants uh, have have come in and you know have said that to make these more efficient to stop losing water to the desert these are the kinds of changes you need to make but you know people continue to make um, decisions that aren't necessarily the most sustainable ones um, in Turkmenistan in particular uh, these kinds of uh, sites where water has collected in the desert are being promoted as new lakes. Um, so there's the Sari Kamish uh, depression, which is actually visible on, on some of the maps that I showed. Um, and, and people back already, I think in the 19th century, were already talking about how if water was diverted away from the Aral Sea, it would probably fill up this other depression and it would form a new lake. And so, you know, we won't have the Aral Sea, but we'll have this Sari Kamish Lake. And so that's great. Of course, again, the, the water has um, been really polluted. Um, so these lakes are not that nice. But in Turkmenistan, um, there's a, a new uh, lake that has collected drainage water and it's called um, Altan Asr, so the kind of golden century lake. And it's going to be a kind of playground in the desert for you know, I guess the Turkmen president and, and <laughs> who knows who, who else. Um, but so they have these ways of kind of, you know, taking what might be a bad situation and trying to put a good spin on it, um, even though it's all very unsustainable um, in the end. And and I don't know. Yeah, I mean, one wonders what the incentives are. You would think that there are a lot of incentives for them to, to build more sustainably. But I think we see, again, all over the world um, that even when... Uh, projects are, are very wasteful. Um, if there isn't legislation put in place, um, if there aren't, you know, people um, kind of overseeing this and, and making sure that things are, are built sustainably or done sustainably, they won't be. Um, in California, there are no incentives for um, people to save water because there, there actually is legislation uh, against being able to, to kind of store water. So a farmer can't, you know, be really careful and store up their, their water allotment and, you know, use it carefully um, and use only part of it this year and save some of it in a reservoir for next year. That's, that's something that they can't do. They have to, if they're given a water allotment, they have to use it all at once. And that leads to terrible water wastage and we're in a drought you know, but, but these are the problems that, that, um, that people face. So I, th I think, you know, in Central Asia, it's, it's probably very similar if you don't have the kind of legislation in place to um, encourage sustainable building, um, people are, are going to cut corners, um, and people are going to use water wastefully, even though it, it obviously um, shouldn't be used that way. And in terms of, of the ethnic group um, most affected, I mean, I guess I would probably say the Karakalpaks, Pucks, but <laughs> Sanjot, would you, yeah, would you agree? Yeah, um, so. again, as this kind of doubly marginalized people, um, and they, the, this is their historic homeland, is the area around the Aral Sea, and you know, one can ask, well, why don't they go somewhere else? But you know, where are they going to go? There is no place for them really. Um, this is the land that the um, their families have lived on and, and have made a living on for centuries. And so, you know, um, one could, could criticize them, but at the same time, it's, it's understandable that they don't really feel that they have a place to go. And they're just kind of waiting for um, the Uzbek government to, to step in and, and help the provincial government to address the problems. So, yeah, thank you for the questions. Yeah, and if they go to other parts of Uzbekistan, they're discriminated against. They don't find work. There's no no place really for them. To, right, to because go. they're not Uzbek. <laughs> they're not Uzbek. I'll yeah. take two, I think, two more questions. Um, 
since you mentioned these parts of Central Asia was de- designed as cotton industry areas and they could receive food and other pro- products from elsewhere, then did the dissolution of the Soviet Union mean a breakdown of these transfers? Did the independent states try to develop a more balanced economy? Yeah, this is a question. This is a really great question. I, I unfortunately don't have a great answer for it. Um, again, you would think that um, they would have learned some lessons and that they would move away from, from dependence um, on cotton. And, you know, to a certain extent, certainly uh, a place like Kazakhstan has a much more diversified economy. Um, but the, the discovery of, of oil and gas has really helped with that. Um, it's also been able to make more changes in the agricultural sector than Uzbekistan has, which has a much more um, kind of Soviet uh, infrastructure, although there have been experiments, uh, you know, with forming like community water user associations to help use uh, water more sustainably, for instance. Um, but but it's, it seems to me uh, to be quite Soviet. Turkmenistan, uh, um, I mean, things really haven't changed there much at all that I know of. And I have never actually been to Turkmenistan. I can't speak very knowledgeably about it. Um, so, you know, you, you would think that they would make some, some efforts, but again, it, it seems to be just kind of easier to continue with business as usual um, in many cases. And in terms of food, that's a really great question. The, the 1990s were a really difficult time throughout the former Soviet space because all kinds of, of systems broke down and, you know, um, uh, companies pulled out of uh the, the non-Russian republics um, and, you know, returned to Moscow or returned to, to the Russian Federation. Um, and so, you know, there were lots of people who didn't have anything in, in the 1990s, really because the, the state that had promised to take care of them from birth until death just disappeared, you know, really overnight. Um, and in terms of, of food in Central Asia, I actually haven't thought about that question. And I, uh, perhaps someone here knows the answer. Um, I don't know, but it's it's a really. I mean, you know, I guess as as I mentioned, by the 1980s, um, Central Asia was producing more food alongside um, more cotton. So so they were um, growing uh, produce for for various parts of the the Soviet Union um, and more uh, crops like wheat um, and things like that. But um, it's yeah, it's something I don't know enough about, and and thank you. I will I will look into that for the next time that I present on this research. Are there local popular environmental cleanup movements in this region? That is yeah, that's been really difficult. Um, you know, I think that uh, as I mentioned in the 1980s, there there was attention drawn to environmental problems. There were political parties. Um, that, you know, once political parties became legalized at the very end of the Soviet Union that organized around environmental issues, it's certainly something that people are aware of. People are aware that the government hasn't done very much to kind of point out, um, you know, that uh, people are living in toxic environments and hasn't done very much to clean those up. So some people have taken it on themselves. Um, there are uh, non-governmental organizations that uh, address environmental issues, but it's very difficult. Um, it's very difficult for people in many parts of these regions to to make a living. And so something like caring for the environment um, kind of has to come on top of that uh, or outside of the job that they get paid to do. So there there are people who care uh, and there are people who care a lot, but I think it's, it's difficult for them to put all their time into it. Um, it's also something, this is something I, I actually studied uh, in the early 2000s. And so I haven't, you know, I don't, I, I don't really know the, the most um, recent situation, but, um, you know, back then, a lot of these organizations, even if they were working on the same issues, like cleaning up the area around the RLC, they were competing against one another to get funding from the same kinds of outside donor organizations and development organizations like uh, USAID or the World Bank. Um, and so it was really sad to me to see that these were people who had a lot in common and who were working on the same kinds of issues. But, you know, in order for their organizations to survive, they needed to get those grants and they needed to get that money. Um, I would hope that that some things are, are better now. And certainly, you know, um, 
in many parts of the Soviet Union, there's a much more of a middle class than there used to be. And there are people who have more time um, to devote to these kinds of issues. Um, I saw an, an interesting short documentary recently about um, a music festival that was held on uh, the, the bed of the Aral Sea. Um, and, you know, uh, they invited people from all over to basically come to the region of the Aral Sea and to have this kind of, you know, rave in the desert. And, um, and, and people you had mixed reactions, but I think, you know, it, it, it did draw some attention um, in, in Uzbekistan, at least, and, and maybe in Kazakhstan as well. Uh, and I think the idea was in part to kind of, you know, get people to, to pay attention and to actually come and see this region themselves and to, uh, to add some money to the local economy and to maybe think about what could be done um, to, to help it. Um, but... Uh, and I'm sure, you know, so I'm sure there are some people who are, are really dedicated to this, but I wouldn't say that there are um, really kind of large scale uh, environmental movements or cleanup movements um, in the region, in part just because it's it's difficult. There's some young people, in particular, people, young, pe young people who are connected through social media globally. Oh, uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, sure. You see it in the Caspian Sea region, also Aral Sea um, Region. Sure, and I think for Uzbekistan, it really um, the demise of the Karimov regime really changed sort of the parameters. Uh, now yes. it's sort of po more possible for NGOs to work there to to sort of it now has opened it's opened up to to grant making. You know, there's a U.S. presence and a and a foreign presence in a way that you know there was a lot of tension between the Karimov regime and and um, the outside. Yeah. I said, well, plus their their own involvement in the cotton industry didn't help either. Right. <laughs> and so, so there are opportunities for people to make connections right. with them yeah. and to talk about things that they hadn't as much before. Yeah. And I, I haven't been to Uzbekistan since the regime changed. So um, this is just what I what I kind of get filtering in, but it's it's much more open. And so I imagine that we'll see um, more, right. yeah, as you said, more young people, especially. Um, turning their their attention to these these ideas, um, and Uzbekistan has recently kind of rejoined the efforts to um, to address the problem of the Aral Sea region. Right. For a long time, they've kind of pulled out. Um, yeah, if you're up for it, they're the, they're the last two questions. I feel bad if I just leave them out. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that efforts are being made to restore the Aral Sea. Is it working? Um, yeah, so that that North Aral Sea that I pointed out, and the the um, the slides that's that kind of little separate bit, that has been a, a kind of a, a minor success story that um, uh, was in part through World Bank funding um, that has created a, a kind of a dike to uh, to keep the water in the that part of the the former seabed. Um, and it actually refilled much more quickly than people were expecting. Um, so that's been a little bit of a success story. Apparently, uh, fish have been reintroduced. So as the Aral Sea dried up and the, the water became uh, progressively um, uh, more saline, so the salts became more and more and more concentrated, all of the um, both endemic species and introduced species of fish uh, died out in, in the Aral Sea itself. But fish have been um, reintroduced to the North Aral Sea, and there are people who are fishing there, apparently. So it's, you know, it's, it's a minor success story. There's supposed to be a phase two where they increase the, the height of the dam um, and, um, and bring more water back. But I, I think those... Um, that project has stalled, um, and I'm not sure if that was kind of world, the World Bank um, getting cold feet. Uh, I can't remember the details exactly, but that's that's definitely a minor success story, I would say. Um, but you know, the the large part of the Aral Sea um, is probably not going to be restored. Uh, so, okay, then the final question, uh, which was actually I think one of the the very early questions. <laughs> Um, I it, was was chat, still it was in the chat chat box. I hope uh, Sam Spencer is still here. Um, it's yeah. interesting to me that the USSR promoting the indigenous people as well as women was active early on in the 20th century, mm -hmm. as contrasted with later ethnic purges by Stalin, who sent some such people, sent some of those people to the Siberian gulags. What was that about? Um, what were those those early projects about? It really came, what is the distinction? Yeah, yeah. It really um, so those 
I mean, it, it was really revolutionary in many ways. And it really came from those anti-imperial um, foundations on which the Soviet Union was established. Um, that there was this idea that, you know, you had this multi-ethnic empire in which uh, many people, particularly in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, had been, um, you know, really uh, oppressed by um, uh, nationalizing uh, projects and, and um, russifying projects that were coming um, from from St. Petersburg. So, um, you know, there, there had been a, a time earlier in the Russian Empire when... Um, there were all kinds of, of people, not just ethnic Russians, who were sort of high up in, in the hierarchy. Um, but in, there was a real promotion of, of the ethnic Russian people, um, you know, by the early 20th century. And so uh, Bolshevik revolutionaries really wanted to, to undo that. Um, there was, you know, they, they were, uh, they saw imperialism as, as closely linked to capitalism. And so this socialist revolution was a point to be about making all people equal, um, you know, not just in the Soviet Union, but around the world. This was, you know, proletarians of the world unite and supposedly race was no longer going to matter. Um, and so they really kind of wanted to put that into practice at home in the Soviet Union. They also saw nationalism as a very potent force. Um, so in World War One, in the wake of World War One, all of these other multi-ethnic empires, um, like the Ottoman Empire and the Habsburg Empire, collapsed along national lines, and you saw the emergence of new nation states. Um, and so it was, it was on you know, on the one hand, it was this, I think, genuine, genuinely revolutionary impulse. But on the other hand, there was a little bit of a, uh, of a cynical uh, background there, where the um, uh, Stalin was actually the first commissar of nationalities <laughs> in the early 1920s. And part of his job was to figure out how to divide up the old territory of the Russian Empire into uh, ethno-territorial units. So into units that were based on uh, ethnic groups. So all these anthropologists and ethnologists were employed trying to figure out, okay, who are the, the peoples who live on the territory of the Soviet Union? Um, you know, which, which people uh, constitute nations and, and which people, you know, are just kind of um, subgroups of various kinds, which people should have their own republics. And that's where you get these you know, places like Uzbekistan um, come from a project of drawing lines on a map and saying, okay, this is where the Uzbek people live and this is the territory of the Uzbeks. And the Karakalpaks were recognized as an ethnic group, but not as an important enough ethnic group to have their own union republic. So they got this autonomous region within the Uzbek Republic. So there's this really kind of complicated plan um, in the 1920s to give all of these different peoples their own territories. And the idea was that then they would be happy. Their nationalist grievances would be satisfied and they wouldn't then put more energy into the cause of nationalism <laughs> and in trying to, you know, pull away from the Soviet Union. Instead, all of these people would exist together in a, a federation, um, in a kind of brotherhood, and they would all turn their attention to the struggle that really mattered, which was the class struggle. Um, but again, as I mentioned, <laughs> you know, this this um, really revolutionary project um, didn't last all that long. It's also been compared to affirmative action, the promotion of ethnic minorities, uh, you know, actually above uh, above Russians, and. Um, the Soviet Union kind of uh, took a step backwards in the 1930s in many different ways. Um, also in terms of empowering women. Uh, so there are kind of much uh, less progressive uh, laws passed in the 1930s when it comes to women and gender roles in the family. Um, and also, you know, then there's also this retreat in uh, the ethnic, um, this, you know, the sphere of managing ethnic relations as well. And in terms of the deportations, um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of one of the outcomes of defining peoples, <laughs> you know, saying, okay, all of these people live here. This is, this is their, their homeland is you can then also target them. Um, so you can say, well, you know, all of the Chechens live here and all of the Crimean Tatars live here and all of the Volga Germans live here. And, and all of these people are, you know, suspect for various reasons and we don't want them to live there anymore. So we're going to remove them from these territories and put them somewhere else. Um, that's kind of the dark underbelly of these very progressive uh, revolutionary policies.
So it's, it's kind of complicated. I hope I explain that. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, I just want to thank you for a wonderful, wonderful talk. And if you were checking out the, the chat, a little bit. I uh, haven't. Was, that, <laughs> that feeling was shared by uh, many of the uh, audience members. So I want to thank you again. And I want to thank, uh, there were almost uh, 100 people who joined us, you know. Um, and I want to thank you all for, for taking the time uh, to join uh, this presentation by the Central Asia Working Group. And I hope to see many of you uh, at, at future events. And of course, Maya. I hope to see you. Yes, uh, at I'll be some back. As well. <laughs> so thank you all very much. Yes, thank okay. you everyone for coming. Thank you for having me and hope to see you soon. Bye.